This is Join Us in France, episode 395, 395. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France, everyday life in France, great places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy, and news related to travel to France. Today, I bring you a conversation with Josh Taylor about visiting France on a student budget. You don't need to be a student to learn from this episode because there are lots of us who enjoy a good deal if we know where to find it. And these days, air travel is getting more and more expensive. Perhaps you can cut back on some other expenses. Honestly, that's what I like to do myself when it's possible. So I look forward to hearing about your tips for enjoying France on a budget. This podcast is supported by donors and listeners who buy my tours and services, including my itinerary consult service and my GPS self-guided tours of Paris on the Voice Map app. And you can browse all of that at my boutique, joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. I find myself in a little bit of a pickle because I am several hundred emails behind. I took 10 days off, as you know, and I haven't recovered <laughs> email-wise yet. I'm not up to date uh, responding to all the people who want to participate in the Immersion Week, May 21st through May 27th next year. Don't despair. I'm getting there. <laughs> I was surprised how many of you responded, which is a good problem to have, but there are a lot of emails for me to deal with. And if you're generally interested, but you haven't made a decision yet, which is fine because we have 11 months to go, remember to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com for a slash newsletter, where I'll update you on the France Bootcamp. Bonjour, Joshua Taylor, and welcome to Join Us in France. Bonjour, Annie. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Oh, lovely to have you. We're going to talk about something we haven't done enough at all on this podcast, which is talking about France on a student budget. It's come up a few times, but never enough. So I'm really excited to talk to you because you have some very good ideas about what to do uh, when you want to travel and you're a student and you're on a budget. So uh, let's get to it right away. You sent me some fabulous ideas and I, I think people will really benefit from listening to this episode. So why don't you take it away, Joshua? Yeah, of course. So some of my ideas are things that have been mentioned in the past that I decided to take on and some of them are things I kind of uh, discovered and some of them are more just like common sense things that maybe uh, you just wouldn't think of. So the first one specifically for students that I was able to do was take advantage of student deals. So these are things like at museums and maybe an 18 to 25 year old will get a lowered price or music clubs a lot. They'll have a lowered price for people uh, in that age range as well. Events, I was often able to get like a free ticket for events that were catered towards maybe an older audience because it seems like France is very dedicated to getting younger people interested in more like artistic things and more cultural events. And I think that's why they have those lower prices for oh, yeah. younger people. In France, if they can find a, a discount or deal to give you, they will be very happy to do it. They'll do it with a smile. It'll actually make their day. I see. You didn't feel that people were like really happy to give you a discount? I mean, I didn't necessarily notice that, but it wasn't something. That yeah, I... yeah, yeah. And you need to bring your student card. If you are a student, even if it's yes. a high school student card or a college student card, bring it. Have it on you because you will use it just about everywhere yeah. you go. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, there were a couple that it was just the age range. I was able to get a free uh, pass to a specific temporary event at the Musée des Arts just because I was in that age range. But then most of the time I did show my student card to get the discount. Excellent. <laughs> Um, and then the last thing with the student deals, plane tickets. Most airlines do have a specific booking, like a specific booking websites for students. You sign up with your student account, student email address, and you can get discounted plane tickets through specific airlines. There are also different other travel agencies that are geared towards students that you sign up with a student email address, and then you get cheaper plane tickets. So I was able to get a really good deal on my plane tickets. That's cool. I, I, I didn't realize that. I mean, it used to be when I was a student, which is, you know, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Just a 
just a few. Yeah. Uh, we had travel agencies just for students, at least mm -hmm. in Toulouse, where I grew up. And that travel agency was called Vastels. I still remember it. Uh -huh. And it was across the street from the train station. And you could go and get really good deals. And I never really took advantage of too many of them because I always thought, you know, you're going to get stranded in Afghanistan or whatever. Because a lot of these were <laughs> to exotic places and I'm not that courageous. I'm not that brave. Uh -huh. But yeah, it was always really interesting to see all the really cheap, train tickets you could get and all of that. But anyway, that's so long ago, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, right. But it's good to know that they still do it. So you just go into Google and type, uh, I don't know, Delta for students or something? The website I used specifically was Student Universe. I, I think it's kind of a conglomeration of all the different airline student deals just onto one website. But it books you through a major airline. And then when I was on the United app, then I saw a specific tab on that app for book a plane ticket for students. Mm. So... You can also do it directly through the airline, I believe. Very good. Excellent. The next thing that um, I did, it's kind of specific to the dates you'll be there. I would definitely suggest looking for events during your dates in the specific cities. For example, when I was there, it was called the Nuit Musée, that there was a night that most of the museums were free. So I was able to do a couple of museums just for free. It was a nice little added bonus that I wasn't expecting. But yeah, there are other events that could be free, could be something that you're not planning on specifically. But then if you look uh, for and say, oh, on the 17th, and there's a fun little event that I could get into for a couple of year or for free and have a little bit more of a local experience, maybe. Yeah. And also, if you're in Paris, look at the ads in the metro. They yes. always advertise all of these things. And sometimes it's for expensive, you know, like the opera, or whatever. That's 100 euros. But they also have like little groups. And if you go to, well, if you're in a group that's like a rock group or something that's not very famous, a lot of these young performers will just put like posters up on wherever they can, like at the bakery or on a board somewhere or, yeah. you know, read those. When I was on the Metro, then I saw a band that I um, listened to uh, their music. They were advertising a concert in Paris that was free. It was actually the day after I left, so ah. I wasn't able to go. But yeah, there, there are things that you normally wouldn't know about. Maybe it will catch your eye there. Yeah, and in Paris, uh, well, in France in general, we have a lot of like uh, cities will put on big events with free concerts and things like that. Like for the 14th of July, that's the next holiday coming up here. They will have balls and like the fireman's ball. It's free, but it is kind of a fundraiser for the firemen. You know, they'll ask for donations or whatever, but it's a free evening. It's a free dance. And there's like, they have beer kegs and things like that. And you usually have to pay for the beer, but it's kind of a fun atmosphere around the Eiffel Tower for the 14th of July. They always have like a big symphony and that's free. Uh, anyway, there are free events all over France around holidays and so you just have to figure out and and the tourist office would also be a good place to ask for what's going on you know i'm here yeah. for two weeks is there something i should know about it doesn't cost any money and you never know what even if it's a mm -hmm. podunk little town they might have something coming up that you need to know about yeah i think that was something that i regret not taking advantage of uh the tourist office especially in some of the smaller towns that i visited i, I found myself just kind of wandering and not really knowing exactly what there was to do. I had done some research, but I, I think I would suggest going to the tourist office unless you have like very specific things that you want to see and do. Yeah, even the French tourist offices, they don't really update their websites all that uh, you know frequently or whatever. And uh -huh. so they probably have things that they can tell you about. And if you're good about asking them specific questions, like you can just go and say, Are there any bars with live music or are there any, you know, whatever it is that you're interested in, just ask mm -hmm. them if they have that. Think of a list of things that might be interesting to you and go ask them. So the next thing was kind of a small specific thing, but if there's any events that you want to do just kind of in general, like if I, I say I want to go see a museum that's interesting or I want to go to a 
greenhouse or a garden, or I want to go see a jazz club, which is something that I did. If you have that activity in mind, then search around because there's probably a free version where you don't have to pay $20 for an entrance fee. And if all you want to do is do that activity, then you might as well find a free version that Mm -hmm. you're uh, not going to have to pay for. And if you're a student, for instance, if you want to try some French wine and you don't have the money for a whole sommelier evening with... Right. Or expensive bottles or whatever, just go to any bar and they'll serve you a glass of wine. Like you could even say, you know, I'll try a glass of wine from the south of France or from the north. Well, the north of France doesn't really make wine, but <laughs> you know, from Bordeaux or from, uh, you know, I want a rose or whatever. And you'll pay, for, you know, three, four bucks for a glass of wine and it'll be yeah, a fun experience. Nice. The next thing was kind of my saving grace as far as budget goes the food, because it's so easy when you're there to spend. An incredible amount of money on food and if you have that money go for it because all the food i had there was obviously amazing and even grocery shopping was one of my like the most fun experiences that i had because this these aisles with all of these french products and it's just fun to look around and see what there is yeah it doesn't um, look like but, albertsons does it <laughs> right <laughs> Quite different. What I did was I set a daily food budget of 20 euros. So basically what I did was did two or three days of I would just go and grocery shop. So I would get a couple baguettes and some cheese and some vegetables, a couple of fruit and just put them in the mini fridge in my hostel or in my Airbnb and use that for my meals for a couple of days. That would basically average out to maybe seven to 10 euros a day. And then I would use that extra money that I hadn't used from the $20 budget to go out and have a nice dinner on the third or fourth day. Mm. So for my two-week trip, then I had three kind of nice dinners. And for the rest of the time, I was just kind of grocery shopping. But I don't even think that I feel like I missed out on any culinary experience because even shopping at the French grocery store, I found some fun French products like roasted pepper spreads and olives that I was able to uh, make some sandwiches with. And so I felt like I got one side of an authentic French food experience and then with the restaurants then I got another side. Yeah. And uh, you can also get classic French dishes. There are sections of the grocery store where they do catering yeah, type of exactly. things. And if you have a microwave, you can just warm it up and enjoy, mm-hmm. you know, your classic uh, gratin dauphinois or whatever it is. It's not that um, expensive. It's a lot cheaper than if you went to a restaurant and ordered that. Yeah. Definitely. Another thing that I um, did was also related. When you're booking, I would recommend always looking for places that give free breakfast because that's going to cut off a lot of cost if you're, if you're paying the same amount for your um, hotel, but it also gives you breakfast. Then that's maybe five euro that you don't have to spend yeah. on a breakfast somewhere else. What I did was I, w- I would eat a pretty big breakfast and then maybe pack a couple of croissants in my and so. I could use that breakfast and then use some of my groceries for lunch, a little snack in the middle of the day. And then if I wanted to go out for a meal in the evening, then do that or use some of my groceries and make myself a nice little sandwich or yeah. some fruit or something for dinner. Most places, the breakfast is not going to have, you know, eggs and bacon and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just bread and jam and butter and yeah. maybe some cereal. Bread, butter and jam is normal French breakfast. Sometimes they do Nutella. <laughs> yeah, there was that at one of the hostels I stayed. There you go. So, you know, that's quality hostel right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say that there was one place that didn't have breakfast. And so there was a boulangerie right next to where I stayed. And one of my favorite memories from the trip is going over there. And it was right after they'd opened. And I ordered a baguette and then went back. And I um, had a jar of jam that I had bought and so I had this warm baguette fresh out of the oven with butter and jam and it was just the most incredible thing like I know it's a very quintessential French experience but just having that warm baguette was absolutely divine well it's great that you did feel deprived that's wonderful to hear yeah there's no reason to feel deprived in France you can find food that you can afford and uh, the, the other thing is you know people get carried away with the best bakery the best this the best that Listen, just go to the one next to you, right? It's going to be fine. You don't need to go all over the town to find the best one. And the other thing that visitors usually like is to purchase things at open air markets, which is fine, Mm -hmm. but it's always more expensive than the grocery store. Okay, so if you want the inexpensive grocery stores in Paris, you're going to have Franprix everywhere. You're going to have not so many Lidl, But in the rest of France, 
Lidl is always a good value. I went to a lot of Carrefour markets. Carrefour market, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, and they're just fine. Right. Yeah. Just walk in and you'll see things that you like. And be a little curious, you know, try something yes, different. Yes, I would you... definitely recommend that. And I did a whole episode, I can't remember which one it was, but I did a whole episode about the price of groceries in French mm. grocery stores. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's a couple years old, so things have gone up a bit. But it would give you an idea of the kind of price range. And I'll link to that in the show notes for this episode as well. Right, for sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was able to, 20 to 25 euro a day was just enough for me to get by on food. You mm-hmm. can obviously spend a lot more than that if you want. Of course. Yes. <laughs> All right. So the next thing, if you're using a specific tra- travel agency to look for um, hotels or flights or something, if you're doing it all on one specific website, if you're starting to plan your trip early enough, then keep an eye out for deals that maybe they'll have like $50 off a hotel a night or $200 off a plane ticket, then you can take advantage of those. And that's not specific to students. That's just kind of something that everyone can do. Mm -hmm. But also checking multiple websites for train tickets, because there are a few that you can book train tickets through, you can book like specifically through SNCF, or there's the WeGo website that I used a lot. And then there's other websites like Rome to Rio and different places. But I was definitely able to find a really low price on a train on this website between these cities. And then there was a really low trade on a different website for these cities. So Mm. if you have enough time to plan and do that, then it's pretty easy to get lower prices on different websites that Lessons AF isn't always going to have the best deal. And again, with trains, keep an eye on notifications for train deals and i noticed that WeGo had a lot of these i signed up for their email notifications yeah and every couple weeks and they would send out like between these cities then you can get a train ticket for 10 euro or yeah they had a deal where all the trains from paris to the loire valley and all the trains between the loire valley cities were five euro and so i got a um, train ticket from paris to saumur for five euros and that was a lot cheaper than I would have in in a different date range. Uh, yeah, keep an eye on those. And WeGo is usually the cheapest way to go in France. And when they send you alerts like this, don't wait too long because those tickets do go. I mean, there are people who just know that they want to go yeah. visit grandma who is wherever, and they're just waiting for mm-hmm. a good price. And they just jump on it the minute it's out. And obviously those l- lowest prices don't, you know it's not forever it forces you to plan a little bit but if you can you will save a lot of money and you can buy we go tickets usually eight months ahead or something yeah it's quite quite a bit in ahead yeah um, in advance yeah so that's a very good way to go also the other inexpensive way to travel in france is with the buses and so there's a bunch of Uh, bus companies that offer unbeatable prices to to go across France. It's inexpensive, but it's very long. Like, you're going to be on the bus forever. Yeah, and the bus drivers, even if they switch off, they have to take breaks, and it's like, oh, kill me now. (laughs) (laughs) So WeGo is a lot better because it's a high-speed train, and it's a cheap train, but it still goes pretty fast. Yeah, I didn't have any problems with traveling with it there were the seats were comfortable they had an outlet if you wanted to charge your phone and there was nothing wrong with that yeah we so, doesn't always have an outlet some seats have an outlet not all of them okay so i guess don't plan on that but it's nice yeah. it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes the other way that's really cheap to travel in france is blah blah car and this yes. is good for students because and this is more like a last minute thing so if you decide oh i want to go wherever tomorrow you go to blah blah car the website and you enter the place and almost certainly you'll find somebody who's going in the same direction and will give you a ride and they just tell you it tells you on the app i'll take you for five bucks or ten bucks or whatever Uh and it's usually not very expensive and it's a good you know cultural experience because you don't know who you're going to be riding with the one disadvantage of that is that typically they won't come and get you you know you have to go to them so mm-hmm. if it's in the same city, but on the other side of the city, it might be inconvenient. So think about that. But, you know, you have somebody to chat with the whole time. So that's good. And use your French. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Did you try Blah Blah Car? I looked um, at it uh, a couple of times, but it didn't end up working with kind of like where I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. But 
I, yeah, I, I did look at it and the prices were definitely pretty unbeatable. So the next thing, I, I think it's specifically only to, um, I know that Delta charges for luggage. So if you can just use carry-ons and that's going to save a hundred or $150 with paying for baggage, I ended up using United and they don't charge for your first check bag. So if your airline does charge for luggage, then if you can find a way to kind of fit everything into a carry-on, then that's one way to save a few dollars. But most airlines these days do give you at least one bag for free. And another thing that's been mentioned before, but I just wanted to throw it out again because it works well, was if you have a specific restaurant that you want to go to or just want a nice French experience in a restaurant, go for lunch rather than dinner because you're going to save a 10 to 20 euro if on the fixed price menu for lunch rather than going for dinner. And it's nice to, to save some money. Yeah. And the next few are kind of specific to planning. First of all, if you have, or if you're able to get free cancellation for a hotel or a train ticket or any, anything that you book, then it gives you a lot more flexibility. I made sure to get free cancellation for everything. And usually it's not, it's maybe like a dollar or two extra, but usually you don't even have to pay. You just have to find the right thing to book. And it gives you a lot more flexibility if like your plans change or you say, oh, I want to stay here for another day, then you can just cancel that train ticket and book for the next day. And I did take advantage of that a few times, even while I was on my trip, I realized I want to be here for one more day. I'm going to cancel this train ticket, get a refund and then book it for the next day. Mm. That gives you a little bit more flexibility and save you some money if you end up changing plans. And when you're planning, I would say give yourself lots of time to sit down and book. Because I, I found myself <laughs> a couple nights before I left, then I realized that I hadn't gotten some of the time to pass the museums. And so I was kind of feeling very stressed out about that. And I almost missed that Nuit de Musée that I mentioned. Um, mm. I almost missed that. I could have, I almost booked the $20 tickets for the museum rather than seeing that was an event that I could have taken advantage of. If you can give yourself lots of time to sit down and take the load off of, oh, I need to find the best deal. I leave in a week and um, I still don't have my train tickets for this city. I'm just going to book the first one that I find. If you have two months and you're constantly like looking in, oh, okay, the price has gone down a little bit. I'll keep an eye on that. And if it starts to look like it's going to go up, I'll book them now. So several months in advance, if you can just kind of Keep an eye on things. Yeah, I, I think if you can start planning a trip six months in advance, you're ahead of the game. For sure. There were a couple times that I booked an overnight train to when I was traveling between cities instead of a hotel. So this is definitely you're sacrificing comfort for price in a pretty extreme way. Yes. But <laughs> so definitely catered more towards younger people who are okay with sleeping in a seat and not necessarily having the most comfortable experience but it saves you a lot of money i got a like 30 euro overnight train ticket from toulouse back to paris instead of getting like maybe a 50 euro train ticket and also paying for a hotel it was definitely not the most comfortable experience but as far as saving money that's kind of what where my mind was and that was the end of my trip i just kind of was getting back to paris so i could get to the airport and leave so definitely not every night if you can take advantage of it once or twice then it'll save you a significant amount of money yes and they do have we have some night trains again in france they mm -hmm. had stopped them and now they have night trains with uh, like uh, couchette so you can book a, a bed but i don't know i didn't like them years ago and i don't think i'm ever going to do that <laughs> but it's, it's possible <laughs> again Mine had a, a reclining sleep seat, so I just kind of reclined back and took took a nap. I mm. didn't sleep all through the night, but it, it worked well enough to get me enough sleep that I could manage the airport and fly home. Cool. And then the last thing, it's been mentioned a few times, but the Navigo Semen Pass, if you're only going to be in Paris for uh, a week and it works with your dates, I think it goes through Sunday night and then yeah. restarts. But I, I use the Metro a lot. I did also did walk a lot. I think I averaged like 10 to 15 miles a day walking. But I also used the Metro a lot. And the having that Navigo Pass was very convenient. And I saved me a lot of money on Metro tickets. Yeah. And you can also do, if you're not arriving on the right day, you could do Navigo Easy, where you just mm -hmm. buy, they're called T tickets. And they have rates for students, I do believe. Oh, okay. So you get a bundle of, you buy them by packs of 10, but they're not like paper tickets anymore. It's on a little card. But buying the little right. card, this little blue card, it cost maybe a buck and a half or something. I think somebody told me they were free by now. Anyway. And I didn't pay for mine, but... Yeah. 
So I think probably. And you load up however many tickets you think you're going to need. And if you're smart and you listen to the podcast and you know that you could just explore the same area all day, you could get away with just two two metro tickets a day. Yeah. So that is all the budget ideas I wrote down. Yeah, they're excellent. They're excellent. Now, you had some challenges during your trip. And I want to hear about those because those are always fun. Yes. The main one was that uh, my wallet got stolen. I, I was in Paris for four days and that whole time that I was very vigilant, I had a um, side bag that I carried through the whole day and I would keep my phone in a, a zipper pocket bag and that was great. I felt safe. I always knew where my phone was and my phone and my wallet were both in that same pocket and it just kind of was against my side and I had my hand on it all day. I felt secure. I knew where my stuff was. And even if a pickpocket wanted to, it, 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 like you're not making yourself an easy target when you have something like that. Mm-hmm. And then I left Paris to go to Saumur uh, to visit that chateau. And in my brain, I was like, all right, perfect. I'm out of the big city. I don't really need to worry about pickpockets anymore. Mm. And so I went into a grocery store and got a couple of snacks and then put my wallet in my pocket. There was a very loose pocket in my shorts. And then left and sat down to um, my snacks. I uh, put my hand on my pocket to see where my wallet was and it was just gone. So I I will say there's a reason that they call it pickpockets. If you can just have a bag with a zipper pocket or a Velcro pocket that you can keep your phone in, phone and wallet, you're going to not regret it. Yes, they Um, are crafty. They are good at it. It ended up being a lot easier to deal with than I kind of expected because I only had like maybe 20 euro in there in cash. And then I just had my debit card. So I kind of dropped my plans for a couple hours and I called my bank to have them cancel the card. And then for the rest of the trip, I used Apple Pay. I I signed up for another debit card with my bank Mm -hmm. and I just added that to my phone and used Apple Pay for the rest of my trip. So I didn't uh, have... My dad and I were trying to figure out a way to send cash through a Western Union bank, but it ended up not working. And I was a little bit worried, but everywhere that I wanted to go, other than the open air markets, most stores and bakeries and restaurants, um, they're going to have that contactless payment. Yeah, I use Apple Pay everywhere. And Mm -hmm. you just have to know which card works where. So I know that Carrefour will take my Amex card on Apple Pay. But anywhere else, if the default card is Amex, it will reject it because they don't take Amex. You just have to have more than one card on your Apple Pay. And you can do Apple Pay with your phone or with your watch, your your Apple Watch or whatever. And it works everywhere. I don't think it's been declined anywhere, like nowhere, not a museum store, not anything. I had a Visa card and I had no problems. It worked everywhere. And the other thing to consider is to bring a debit card. And I will explain this briefly, but French credit cards are not really credit cards. They are pay at the end of the month, pay off entirely at the end of the month cards. You know, very few people in France have a, an actual credit card where you can, you know, pay interest forever uh, because that's just against uh, the government uh-huh. doesn't allow that. Uh, it's only allowed for people who make a lot of money. So vendors in France are used to debit cards and Sometimes, I don't know why, but sometimes actual American credit cards don't go through. And it's because it's a credit card. If you had used a debit card, it would work. So just bring a debit card if you have one or perhaps two from different banks if you want to be safe. But, you know, if you have a debit card and Apple Pay or there's an equivalent, right, for Google payments? Yeah, I think there is a Google Pay. Yeah. You know, just have those things and also set up your phone. Phones these days, they have theft prevention things or things where you can, you know, kind of break your phone from a distance. So set it up on a computer. And if you run into a pickle, you can just say, well, my phone's gone, but at least I can erase of the data off my phone. So use all of these things as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Um, but yeah, pickpockets are good at it. They are just good at it. (laughs) And that's why they keep doing it. Yeah. Just be very vigilant no matter where you are. All right. The next little challenge that I had, there were a few times where one time I got on the wrong train. So I was in Blois and there was a train to Orléans and then there was a train to, it was a city like four kilometers outside of Orléans. Mm -hmm. And 
I got on the train to Orléans, which is not where my uh, connecting train was. The uh, conductor scanned my ticket and he said, oh, you're on the wrong train. And I was like, oh, no, this is not good. So very quickly, I was able to figure it out because there was a train going from Orléans to that other train station a couple minutes after I arrived. Mm-hmm. It was a stressful 15-minute interchange, but I got through the train ticket, and then it was just a minute until my connecting train was leaving. Mm-hmm. So that, that was where the SNCF Connect app came in handy because you can book uh, tickets really easily through that. And so don't freak out if something like that happens. You're going to be able to get to where you need eventually. Yeah. It might take another couple hours and you might need to spend a little bit more money on a different ticket. But that app was really very user friendly and keeping it all on your phone and having the ticket on your phone and everything was very convenient. Yeah, I think uh, SNCF Connect is a good app. It, it really helps and it gives you notifications mm-hmm. if there's any changes or, you know, the train's not going for whatever reason, probably a strike. But it could also be that there's a, I don't know, there was an accident on the tracks. You know, your young people use apps like... That's right. what they're for. Like, they're really handy. Once you learn how to use them, they're really helpful. Exactly. Another thing not specific to my trip, just kind of in general, the physical exhaustion I definitely dealt with a lot, especially because part of my trip was a three-day um, solo bike tour through the Laura Valley. And so I was, in total, I biked 110 miles over three days. And I'm not like a cyclist here yeah. in the States. I ride my bike kind of casually. So that ended up being a lot. It was almost was reaching the threshold of, what my body couldn't handle. If you're going to do that, then definitely be aware of your capabilities. I was proud of myself for finishing it because it was definitely a a difficult thing. And obviously it was beautiful and definitely the scenery was worth it. But be aware of your bodily capabilities, even just walking around. Plan in times to rest and sit down in just a couple hours just to sit maybe eat a snack, go to a garden and just sit and enjoy the scenery. Yeah. People watching. Don't be on your feet. Yeah, don't, don't plan to be on your feet um, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, because it's going to get to you after a few days. Yeah, yeah. And if you're an office worker every day for years and then you go to Paris and all of a sudden you have to be walking everywhere, let me tell you, mm-hmm. it's going to be difficult for your body, okay? <laughs> the older you are, the harder it is. Yeah, so if you can, start walking before your trip so you get used to it. But if yeah. not, just just accept the fact that you're tired and you just need to take it easy. Slow down. Yeah, I never felt disappointed when I had to stop and uh, I just kind of sat in the park for an hour, an hour and a half and listened to a book or just kind of watched and ate a baguette or something. Those are just as enjoyable experiences as going to a restaurant or going and seeing a big tourist attraction. All of these things just kind of conglomerate that make your trip into something that's very unique and special to you. If you have an hour to sit in the garden, then you might have a fun experience with someone coming and talk to you. Or you might see a fun little thing happening in the garden or a band might start playing. All of these things, whatever you end up doing, I doubt that you'll be disappointed because it just, like I said, kind of conglomerates into making your trip special to you. Yeah, and it's also different from home anyway, quite a bit different. So it'll be pleasant. And then one of the last things, so this is my second time going to France. And the first time was before my senior year in high school. And it was my first time out of the country. So everything was very exciting. I went with a few friends and it was a trip through the high school. So my French teacher was there. And constantly I was just like, my mind was boggled by all these amazing things that I was seeing. And this cool culture. And so throughout the whole trip, I was just on this constant high of this is all so cool. And I'm having a great time and I'm with my friends. And I think I was partly expecting on this trip to have a very similar experience. But because I was alone, well, traveling alone, at least, and it was my second time here, then some of the magic had kind of uh, dissipated to the point of looking at things for a more realistic perspective. And so mm. like your first time seeing the Eiffel Tower is really cool, but then it's not the same as the <laughs> third time on your second trip that you just, you catch a glimpse of it and it's like, all right, that, that's fun. Yeah. I guess my advice for that is try not to have too many expectations for your trip and plan things that you're excited about so that you have activities that you're really looking forward to going to, but just kind of let your vacation turn into whatever it's supposed to and don't have any expectations for this specific thing to be amazing because if it ends up being a little bit disappointing, then you're not going to 
have your day be ruined. Yeah, beware of uh, Facebook friends who had the best everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then you go and you're like, oh, it's not the right. best. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, France is incredible, but it is still just like a country and it, bad things can happen and good things can happen. Just let, let your trip turn into what it's supposed to be and don't put too much pressure on it to be the most incredible thing that has ever happened to you and ever will happen to you. <laughs> Excellent. That's good advice. <laughs> That's good advice. Okay, let's talk about your favorite activities that you did. We won't have time to go into all the places that you visited, but at least favorite activities. That would be fun to know. One of the things that was very surprising to me that I wasn't uh, expecting to be in great, but actually ended up being one of my favorite things to do was, I don't know if you've been to them. It's this whole exhibit. I think it's like 30 or 40 different little mini gardens that different artists have created and set up there. And so there were so many just very incredible things. There was one that was kind of like Alice in Wonderland themes, and there were a few little modernized Japanese gardens. There were some like abstract art. There was trees cut into weird shapes, different like abstract art scattered throughout this little mini garden. And so you take this path that's a couple kilometers long and you're in kind of this tunnel of trees and on your left and there's a little tunnel through the trees and it opens into this mini garden. And then you experience that and then go back out. And mm. on your right, there's a different little mini garden that you experience. And there's like a Kenyan themed fountain garden and there was like a Mediterranean themed garden. Uh, yeah, that sounds really intriguing. I, I want to go now. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. I, I, I had a couple hours there and I honestly could have spent four or five because there were, I think I missed like half the gardens because it closed while I was there. Are you a garden uh, fan in general or was this one really? I, I do. I, I definitely enjoy the uh, gardens at the chateaus more than the interiors. I wouldn't say that I'm like a garden fan necessarily, but I do definitely appreciate them and this was even for people who aren't necessarily super interested in gardens there was lots of really cool visual art in each of the gardens and it's really fun to see these different different artistic gardens set up very cool um yeah so another one of my favorite activities that i didn't necessarily expect to but ended up being really incredible was the Musée d'Orsay. I'm not necessarily like an art fan or an art appreciator, but I was excited to see some of the pieces at the museum. I ended up spending twice as long there as I expected to because I was just fascinated by all these different paintings and I would walk past something by this very obscure artist and then look at it for like 10 minutes just appreciating how they painted the light. I was so fascinated by how different artists utilize light in their paintings. It mm. was just so cool. Did you do a, a tour, like an audio tour, or was it just you enjoying the museum I, like that? It was just me. I had the audio guide. I used it less than I expected to. I kind of just went through the chronological and then circled back to the sculptures and photography. I didn't have time to do any of the temporary exhibits, but it was very, very incredible. So if you like art at all, I would definitely recommend. And a couple of the other more authentic experiences, I guess. I went to a jazz club on the Rue de Rivoli that it was in this little underground kind of cave. You went down these stairs, pretty small. There were maybe like 30 seats and they were all packed together. But it was just me and a bunch of other university students from what I could tell. And there was a little 30 minute like jazz concert. And then it turned into kind of like this jam session. So you could go up and play the piano and the other two drummers and the drummer in the bass would just kind of go along with you and it was just a really really cool experience I had some fun conversations with a couple of the <laughs> students there and got to practice my French and it was just really fun I felt like this is something that I would do if I were a student at the Sorbonne or something yeah so um, did you play or yeah, I, I did. I did a little bit of piano. I kind of embarrassed myself at the beginning, but we got to the point where we played played some music together. Oh, that's wonderful! Um, it was all a very, very fun experience. And then a similar thing, I went to a drag show in the 18th, and it was at a place called Madame Arthur. It was something that was this specific drag club was featured in a TV show that I really like, and so that's kind of what got me interested in going. So. I was like, I'm going to have the same experience that this character that I like went to. <laughs> and again, it was something, everyone there was French. There wasn't another tourist there. Uh -huh. And I was just up on this balcony looking down at the stage. And it was a hilarious show. All of the drag queens were very talented. And uh -huh. I really, really enjoyed it. So was this well. RuPaul? This is somebody who was on RuPaul? No, it was 
the show is The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and she goes to Paris and goes to this drag club. That's the drag club that she went to. Cool. So then the other thing, one of the things that I really enjoyed, this is my my splurge activity, I guess. (laughs) I went to a ballet at the Palais Garnier, and it was absolutely magnificent. I spent 80 euros on the ticket, so definitely a more expensive activity, but... It was something that I was really looking forward to for a while. So it was something I was willing to spend more money on. And it was kind of three in one. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but they had a little mini Carmen ballet. And then there was another contemporary dance that kind of told the story of this couple through their marriage and death. And then there was this very modern art piece throughout the whole ballet. There was this guy filling up a bathtub as all the dancers were dancing. As it got more intense, then the music got louder and then at the very end all the dancers were dancing very wildly and the orchestra was going crazy and then the guy filling up the bathtub runs and jumps into the bathtub and it splashes everywhere and then the lights go dark so it was a very very contemporary yeah. piece but i loved it it was so visually interesting i will add to the show notes a link to buy last minute tickets there's a ticket exchange for the ballet, yeah. for the Garnier. So I'll put the link there. You never know. You might find something less expensive. But usually the ballet mm-hmm. and the opera is expensive. I mean, that's just how it is. Uh, yeah. And there are student deals for specific shows as well that you can get a ticket for 20 euro or something. And also, if you're there at the right time, then they do a special premiere showing for students where all the tickets are 20 euros. Right before their opening night, then they'll have a special showing for students specifically. Yeah, so really quickly, I really enjoyed the Sony Lumiere show at Blois, and I know that most of the Chateau have them. So I wasn't expecting to like it as much as I did, but it was this really immersive experience with all the projections and music and told all the history of the Chateau, and it was really, really cool. Oh yeah, those are um, good. They're very immersive and very just really nice. Yeah. And then the last thing, when I was in Paris, I woke up really early one morning and did a walk on Ile de la Cité, saw the sunrise, and it was really gorgeous. There was pretty much no one on the streets. Um, And the people that did, that were on the streets, I noticed were very, maybe it was because I was alone or maybe because there wasn't very many people there, but five or six people stopped and just talked to me, asked me what I was doing. And there was someone who asked me out that morning and I was like, thanks, but no, but (laughs) it's a fun (laughs) little experience that I had. Um, Yeah. So yeah, I did notice throughout the trip, it was probably because I was alone, but people were very, like, a lot of people stopped and talked to me for this reason or that. But it, it made it really nice to have a lot of little interactions oh, yeah. with French people. Oh, that's great. Okay, so you have other recommendations, but we're not going to go into them because otherwise it'll be yeah. too long. But I, there will be, if you visit the show notes for this episode, there will be a guest notes button. Click on that and you'll see the other things that Joshua has not had the chance to talk about. Joshua, it's been lovely talking to you. I really think uh, this is really helpful information for young people and uh, people who want to visit France on a student budget. Even people who are not students, some of us, you know, we have to watch our pennies. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Exactly. Merci beaucoup, Joshua. Merci beaucoup. Au Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com for slash join us. I'm still working on uh, reorganizing the rewards a little bit. And I haven't gotten to that either. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you have been doing it for years. You're wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Melanie Ingler and Linda Nyland. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. If you're planning a trip to France, and I hope you are, and listening to as many episodes as you can to get ready, keep listening because that's a great way to get ready for your trip. Search the website because, you know, there's been a lot of episodes. (laughs) Even I forget what all we've talked about. So if you just go by your memory, even if it's stellar, you are going to miss a lot of stuff. 
you can also hire me to be your itinerary consultant. I've made some changes to the service to make it better. Here's how it works now. You purchase the service on joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique, and then you fill out a document to tell me what you have in mind. We make a phone appointment and we chat for about an hour, and then I send you the document with the plan we've discussed. Now, remember that my time is always booked up several weeks in advance. You'll see the date for my next appointment availability on the only page where you can buy this service at joinusinfrance.com boutique. Pay attention to that date, please. I am recording this on June 23rd. And as of today, I'm booked up until August 15th just to give you an idea. I do love talking to you, my listeners. Your questions always bring up new things. I love this job, but there's just one of me and lots of you. So please be patient. And if you can't talk to me because I'm all booked up, you can still take me in your pocket by getting my GPS self-guided tour of Paris on the Voice Map app. So there's five of them in Paris. Let's see if I can remember them all. The first one was Ile de la Cité. The second one was Le Marais. The third one was Montmartre. And then I moved on to Saint-Germain-des-Prés. And then the last one, the Latin Quarter. So if you do those tours, you will get a wonderful overview of Paris. And I take you to some really, really cool places. Now, I understand that to some of you, eh, this is a new thing. Why use an app? Maybe you prefer to be an in-person thing. Sure, in-person tours can be very good, but usually for most people, it's either an app or bumbling around on their own, and the app makes it a million times better than bumbling around on your own. If you enjoyed this episode, you might also want to listen to episode 364 about spending a month in France on a budget that was with our friendly Canadian police officer and an oldie but goodie episode 141. It was called Paris on a Budget. This week in French news, the legislative elections are over and the big winner is Marine Le Pen. Her party got enough representatives elected to be a major force of opposition to Macron's party. She did 10 times better than everybody predicted. The whole time, the press wouldn't stop talking about Mélenchon and his NUPES, left-wing coalition, but he did really poorly by comparison. Now, in a way, I'm happy that the parliament is going to be a better representation of how French people feel and vote. I wish they didn't feel the way they do, but I think it's better to listen to people that you don't agree with than shut them out entirely and then get surprised uh, when they go nuts. But the reality is it's not going to make life easier for Macron. It's going to be hard for him to get very much done, but nobody ever said that being the president is easy. I fear we're going to be back to gridlock to some extent because, you know, the far left, the far right, and Macron's party, which is kind of in the middle, will fight over everything. But it won't change anything for you visitors, so don't worry about it. It probably won't change that much for me either, and I live here full time, so... COVID is on the uptick again. Nothing super worrisome, but there is an uptick. Still no restrictions of any sort in France other than the obligation to wear a mask when visiting hospitals and doctor's offices. But I think it's wise to wear a mask anywhere you're in close quarters with people. I can't wait to get my second booster shot. It's only available to people 60 and up in France right now. Uh, But the second they make it for people 50 and up, uh, I'll get in line right away. Uh, I need it. (laughs) Well, I think I need it. Maybe it's just all in my head. Who knows? For my personal update this week, I got my electric car. It is such a joy to drive. It's very different from the old VW. It's an MG Marvel R. And it's a car that they don't sell in the US, so you haven't seen it around. But it's pretty spectacular looking, if you ask me. By the way, someone emailed me saying that my use of the term ghetto car last week was offensive. Now, I I did not mean to offend at all. It didn't even 
occurred to me that it might be offensive. The car is being recycled as we speak, and that's good because it was very old. Nothing worked in the car. It had outlived its usefulness, which is why I called it the ghetto car. But maybe I shouldn't have. Who knows? This week was exciting because I had a medical appointment to get my left knee looked at. It's been hurting for months, and my doctor said I needed to do an orthogram of that knee. If you don't know what an orthogram is, be glad it's not pleasant. The exam per se wasn't that bad because they did a local anesthesia, but when the anesthesia wore off, ooh, <laughs> Yeah, not pleasant. They had obviously put needles in places where they're not supposed to go. But it is getting better now, 28 hours after the procedure. I have a full report from the radiologist, very friendly, very nice young radiologist. Uh, we're very lucky. We have a lot of really uh, pleasant doctors uh, in France. When I was a kid, I didn't like doctors. But now that I'm an adult, I'm like, you know, these people are really trying hard to make everybody comfortable and do the best they can. Anyway, so I'll take my result from the radiologist to my family doctor tomorrow, and she'll explain it all. But just from Googling what the radiologist wrote, I fear that there might be a knee replacement in my f future. Anyway. But I want to be able to keep walking and keep doing things. And so whatever it takes, I will do to stay healthy. The thing is, I had to take my new car to a crazy busy part of Toulouse where that clinic is. And I had planned to park in a parking lot with EV chargers not far from the clinic and get a boost and all that and try this new public charge station, you know, because it's always exciting. It's all new to me. But I couldn't because my EV is a kind of SUV size. It's a big car. And that parking lot where they have the chargers is teeny tiny. And I just couldn't get in. I tried twice. You know, I, I took one try and mm, no. And so I left. And then uh, two minutes later, I'm like, well, you are the parking queen. You can do this. And so I went back and no, I still couldn't do it. So I parked at a nearby grocery store where it's such a busy area that they charge for parking at that grocery store, which is unusual. They normally don't do that. And I found a good spot that was big enough for the SUV and I had room on all sides. You know, having room on all sides where you park is a luxury in France. So when you come to France, do not rent an SUV unless you absolutely have to, because even if you are the parking queen, sometimes you can't do it. So I'm a bit paranoid. I took photos of all sides of the cars around me and all that, you know, my car and the cars next to me and Nobody bumped me or anything. <laughs> it's just paranoia. How long do you think the paranoia should last with a new car? I don't know. It's been so long since I've had a new car, I don't remember. But this EV is perfect for me. I, you know, I drive cautiously all the time. Now even more so because this car is like a, a computer on wheels. It's amazing. It, it rings and buzzes. Uh, I'm not always sure why. Sometimes I know, but sometimes I'm like, nah, Why? <laughs> But I am still loving driving this thing. First road trip in the EV is today, the day I've released this episode. And we'll visit a new place in the Pyrenees that I'll be happy to tell you about at some point. Show notes and full transcript for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 395, the numeral transcripts. Remember, transcripts, they make the website easy to search. And you can help your Francophile friends plan their visit to France and have a great time. Go to joinusinfrance.com, click on the share buttons on the side and tag your friend. They will thank you because they're going to learn stuff. Next week on the podcast, an episode with Elise of Toulouse Guided Walk. She's my favorite art historian. And that episode is perfect for her because it's about an amazing artist called Rosa Bonheur. Rosa Happy. Isn't that a great name? Uh, she was the opposite of the starving artist. She painted some of the most amazing pieces. Just a very inspiring person. So I think you will enjoy that episode. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent 
and copyright 2022 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Thank <laughs> you.